Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Calvin Mack of STEM NOLA, and welcome again to a STEM at home event from STEM NOLA. You know, here we are a year later, 14, 15 months into the pandemic, but I'll never forget the day, March 12th, when we got the call and said that everything needed to shut down. March 13th, we had 20 people getting on airplanes to go to three different places in this country in Barbados to do five events. And we didn't know what the future uh, held. Six weeks later, we jumped up on Zoom and we've been doing STEM at home on Thursdays ever since, just since the COVID hit. And we've been in the midst of the pandemic. We've engaged over 17,000 young people in 47 states and five countries. I say that to say thank you for trusting us uh, to bring hands-on science, technology, engineering, and mathematic engagement into your home. Again, I'm Dr. Calvin Mackey, and I'm happy today because we have a, a great topic that we're gonna get into called, uh, called solar energy. And we have a representative from a local uh, architecture firm that's gonna talk about sustainability and, uh, and how all that relates together. So at STEM NOLA, what we believe is that we're creating a high functioning STEM community. And a high functioning STEM community is child-centered, adult governed elder rule. So we focus all of our energy on K-12 kids and students. We surround those students with, uh, with, with college students and we pay the college students. We put over a million dollars in the hands of college students in the last seven years uh, by hiring them as interns, training them, and then having them engage in the young people. Then we surround them with STEM professionals who we call the elders, who are the teachers, the skilled trade men and women. So we say we have vertical mentoring. So on today, young people, uh, you're a K-12 student. You get to meet professionals like myself and our volunteer. And then we have one our now our staff members, but she used to be a college intern, who's going to present to you. Parents, in the 21st century, we believe your students are only going to have one or three options. Either they're going to take something, break something, and or make something. And if we don't give them the skills and the education and exposure to make something, like make a living, make a life, make a difference, that only leaves them with the two options that we see on the news every night and that's to take in a break. And we don't want that for any of our young people. In the 21st century, young people, you're either training yourself from the neck up or you're training yourself from the neck down. If you're training yourself from the neck down, your competition is the automatic machine. And the automatic machine will be the slave of the 21st century. The automatic machine will be these robots and things that are doing work that otherwise human beings used to do. And the funny thing about the pandemic is that it has uh, expedited the transition to automatic machines for many companies and corporations because they said the next time we have a natural disaster, uh, next time we have a pandemic, we don't want to be in a position that we have to shut down because we cannot be operational. For example, what I have before me here is a humanoid. A humanoid is a robot that tries to mimic a human. And this is our humanoid I'm gonna wait for him to get the vision, right? But we, this is our humanoid, Alpha, and Alpha can do many of the physical things that you can do as a human being. For example, Alpha can do push-ups. Alpha can show off just like you. Stop it, Alpha. And like me, after I take a long ride on my Peloton, it takes me a long time to get up. And if you think you're going to go into the world of entertainment and, you know, and take the world by storm and you're not going to have any competition, guess what? Alpha can dance also. Go Alpha. Alpha has these servos, which are motors. And these motors are where our joints are. And we can program these uh, motors to do all types of uh, repetitive behaviors like human. Alpha gonna dance for the saints. That's Alpha, you look at the Alpha stood on her head. And you think you're gonna out dance, out operate, out maneuver these machines. There are people working every day doing research. Give it up, Alpha. There are people doing research every day to better enhance the movement, the mobility, 
and the stability of these machines so that they can uh, do the jobs that uh, humans choose not to do and even do some jobs that are too dangerous for humans. Two years ago at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Ubitech Robotics built this, this miniature humanoid, but they reviewed a life-size humanoid, five feet six, called Walker, and they estimate in the next 10 years, in the next 10 years, the next decade, all of us may have our own personal servant doing household chores for us that we might not otherwise want to do. So parents, young people, my advice to you is to make sure that you develop yourself from the neck up, develop your heart and develop your brain so that you can control the robots and the robots and the machines do not control us. And that's our why. And that's why it's very important for all of us in the United States of America, wherever you all may be in the world, to be STEM literate and understand the world around us. And that's why we do at, what we do at STEM NOLA. And that's why today we are, we are looking at solar energy because alternative energy, especially solar energy, is going to play a big role in our future. And today I'd like to introduce to you our uh, volunteer, uh, Z Smith. Z Smith is the principal and director of sustainability and building performance with SQ Dumas Ripple. We just call it EDR. Uh, and he has degrees from the University of Southern California, MIT, Princeton, and UC Berkeley. Look like he just went to the Ivy Leagues and said, I'm never leaving. But I'd like to introduce to you our friend, Z Smith. Z. Z, you're muted. There. And there uh, great. Uh, let's see. Sure. OK, good. Is everyone able to hear? Then I'll, I'll get started. So um, as uh, Dr. Mackey said, uh, I'm Z Smith from EDR here in NOLA. Um, I was asked to maybe give you a little sense of my background and how I ended up pursuing a career in architecture at the kind of trajectory starting out in uh, other STEM fields and architecture is another STEM field. So I grew up in the upper Midwest, Illinois and Michigan. When I looked out my window growing up, this is the kind of thing I'd see. Um, you might call it corn. I look at it now and I say, those are uh, 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 biological devices for harvesting solar energy. Um, but when I was growing up, one of the big events that happened was these uh, gas shortages and suddenly the energy crisis. And that really determined the fate of where the country was going. And the whole question was, how could we get enough energy when there seemed to be so much, uh, such a finite source of fossil fuels that made things like gasoline? And at that time, it was brought to my attention that the amount of energy that strikes the earth in a single hour is more than the entire world consumes in a year. So we're getting all this energy for free. Why can't we put it to use? Well, the answer is at that time, there was use of solar cells, solar energy to harvest power for say a satellite up in space, but it was incredibly expensive. So the question was, how could we make it cheaper? So how these solar cells work, maybe later you'll get a chance to play with some of these things, is sunlight strikes a piece of a material, typically the chemical silicon, the element silicon, that's been altered a little bits with little bits of trace chemicals in one side and the other. And what that does is it makes a pump that sunlight hits it and it kind of drives the pump. And so that can push electrons out. And then just like any good pump, it needs to bring the water on back, needs to bring the energy back in, bring the electrons in the other side. And so that can then be used to do work, to run a motor, to run a car, uh, to run lights and so on. And uh, you'll get into the details of that as you, as you explore that topic. So my career in, in STEM began when I said, I want to make a difference and, and bring about this change in how people are using energy, maybe something that would be this infinite source, which is sunlight. So I went to, I got into MIT in Boston and I was able to go at a time when they basically uh, the amount that I had to contribute was low enough that I had all I had to do was get a job in a lab to work. And I got a job in a lab working on these, which is concentrating solar cells. They said, solar cells are expensive. So let's figure out a way to, instead of covering everything with lots of solar cells and spending a lot of money, let's make a little solar cell and concentrate the light with mirrors to, to a small, super efficient one. And we pushed that technology and pushed it that, that technology further and further. Um, then... Um, I moved away to Princeton uh, where I worked in a research lab 
And then in nearby the university to that research lab was at Princeton University. And um, I got a job at the opposite end of solar, which was the opposite strategy is rather than make a super efficient, maybe kind of expensive solar cell, what if we made one that was so cheap you kind of could spray it on, maybe something flexible, it would be easy to kind of unroll onto a roof, things like that. And so I worked on advancing that technology. Um, and then after I got done with my uh, degree um, in engineering from Princeton, I got a job at Xerox, their Palo Alto Research Center. This is the company that invented the laser printer. They invented and developed the graphical user interface on computers that you see on, on Macs and on Windows PCs these days. And uh, they were interested in that same material to make printers and scanners and things like that. Um, that uh, uh, work then advanced on and I got interested in the intersection between uh, energy and buildings. And the place that was about the best in the world for that was Berkeley, right there also in the Bay Area, not far from Xerox. And so I ended up taking an architecture degree from UC Berkeley. Um, after that, uh, my career took me up to Vancouver, British Columbia, just, just over the border from Seattle. Um, and one of the buildings that I worked on there was a building pursuing net zero energy through a combination of solar energy and recapturing the waste energy of nearby buildings. Um, and it was also one of the earliest mass timber buildings, buildings, really huge buildings built out of wood. And after all, what is a tree but a giant machine that sucks carbon dioxide out of the air and uses it to make the thing it needs, the, the wood that holds up the building. And so these are giant solar energy harvesting machines and why don't we make our buildings out of sunshine? That's the idea behind mass timber construction. Since then, I've moved to New Orleans where I get to work at SQ Dumas Ripple, about a 50 person architecture firm here in New Orleans. And um, some of you have heard presentations by other members, uh, colleagues of mine, including Will Netter and uh, uh, Ryland um, on different topics. Um, but what I wanna talk about now is how does solar energy interact with architecture? And it's easiest to think about if we think about it for our own houses. This is the house that I live in. And in fact, I'm sitting in right now. Um, it's a house that was first built in 1880. Uh, and even though it's an old house, it's a house that is net zero energy, which means that these solar panels on the roof generate all the energy in a year that we will consume in a year. It's essentially an all electric house. And um, sometimes the year, like in the spring and fall, I don't have the air conditioning on, we actually push energy onto the electric grid. So we push electricity out to all of our neighbors and they say, thank you very much. And we kind of take credit for it. And then in the dead of winter or on the really hottest days of summer, we might pull energy from the grid, but on average it all adds up and we're net zero. In fact, we added a few more um, solar panels just last year, and now we have enough that we're net positive. We can actually charge an electric car or use it for other, other purposes like that. We've added batteries to this house, which allows us here in New Orleans, we're always concerned about heavy storms. Obviously, Hurricane Katrina people have heard about, but we get storms every year that knock out the power lines. And so rather than have a generator that runs on gas, we can store that power during the day and use it at night and actually go for days and days. And so our batteries happen to be from Tesla and they have a nice little app on the phone that you can watch the solar power being generated, the power excess power going into the batteries and then uh, the power that are, is being exchanged with the utility companies. But we wanna use that for more than our own houses. We wanna use it to lower the cost of, how, of living and the cost of, of residences and housing for everybody. So this project SBP St. Bernard Project, um, St. Peter Multifamily is a 50 unit apartment building we opened about a year ago now in New Orleans and it's designed to be net zero also. It's an incredibly affordable place to live because the energy bills are almost zero. Um, and that's achieved through making a building that's super efficient and then putting some solar panels on top. Um, so you can see that design here. It's in the middle of uh, the heart of New Orleans. Uh, and then on the rooftop, you look and basically all of the surfaces of the roof, there's the little air conditioning and heating pump, heat pump units are here. They suck heat out of the air in the winter and they push, uh, they push heat out of the building in the summer when it's too hot. And all of those things are powered by the electricity that um, is generated by the rooftop. 
And there's a special kind of battery or a way that this building has that allows it during the last really bad set of storms where a lot of power was knocked out uh, in New Orleans, this building just kept right on going because it's ability to store energy that's generated from sunshine. And it doesn't have to be expensive. It's a thing that can actually be very affordable. This project was built for about the same cost per square foot as a typical apartment building in New Orleans. And yet um, it's got incredibly low um, energy bills and a good comfort and good air quality for good health. So those are things that we can do by integrating those things together. As we scale up from there, there's, um, uh, it's really important if you're interested in helping this transition to getting off fossil fuels and getting onto renewable clean power to know that the, the category of, uh, they do a survey every year of what kind of jobs are the fastest growing jobs in every state. And a couple of years ago, this chart came out, solar panel installer was the fastest growing career in eight states in the country. Also, every, um, this is growing exponentially, which means the more there is, the more growth we see. And what we're seeing, for example, uh, in just uh, the eight years from uh, 2010 uh, to uh, uh, 2009 to 2017, solar grew by a factor of 10 worldwide. And that growth is just gonna keep on going and it's gonna keep on going. So you can be part of that transition if you, if you want a career in uh, a STEM related career in solar energy and you can help transform the world from one where we're making pollution that's changing the climate and making storms more severe to a world where we live on the income that we're getting for free from the sun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Z. Give it up for Z. Thank you, EDR, for being a great community partner, especially being a partner to uh, STEM NOLA. Now, next up, we have Kennedy Greenwood. Uh, Kennedy started uh, working at STEM NOLA as a freshman in college. She has a bachelor's in kinesiology from Southeastern Louisiana uh, University, but she started here like four years ago as a freshman, and she worked at STEM NOLA on the weekends and the summers the whole time she was in college. And now she actually works for STEM NOLA. So I welcome to you, Kennedy Greenwood. Kennedy. And the activity for the day is solar, solar updraft towers. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Dr. Mackey stated, my name is Kennedy Greenwood, and I will be leading today's session. Um, we're going to start by going over our agenda just to see what's on our to-do list for today. So first we have our vocabulary terms. Vocabulary terms are just some terms we actually keep in mind when performing these experiments because they will be mentioned pretty often. Um, next are our objectives and activity questions. Activity questions are questions you should keep in mind while performing this, while performing this experiment. And then we will move on to our actual activity, building our solar updraft tower. And lastly, we will review and answer those activity questions and go over any other questions you all may have. So first is vocabulary, solar energy. What is solar energy? Solar energy is energy from the sun that is converted into thermal or electrical energy. Solar energy is something that's becoming increasingly popular. Um, next is solar tower. Solar tower is a type of solar furnace using a tower to receive the focused sunlight. It uses an array of flat movable mirrors to focus the sun's rays upon a collector tower. Next is a solar panel. A solar panel is an electrical device consisting of a large array of connected solar cells. Solar panels are what we see on top of people's homes, as Mr. Z um, stated earlier. And lastly on our list is solar nuclear fusion, which is the process by which the sun releases energy that the solar panels can use to generate electricity. In the sun, hydrogen atoms are fused to create helium. And now I believe, yes, we have a question. Uh, which of these can solar energy not be converted to? A, thermal, B, water, or C, electrical? And I want you guys to keep in mind our vocabulary terms when answering this question. I'll give you all a few more seconds.
All right, are you guys answering those questions? And water, you guys are correct. So next are our objectives. Hopefully by the end of today's session, you all will be able to understand the meaning of the term solar energy, solar tower, solar panel, and solar nuclear fusion and apply them to the project correctly. And you will also be able to create your own solar updraft tower. What are we experimenting with today? A, solar energy, B, wind, or C, force of motion? You guys got this. We just went over this. I'm gonna give you all a few seconds to answer that. All right. And you guys are correct. We will be experimenting with solar energy today. So the questions of the day, these are the activity questions that we ask you all to keep in mind while performing this experiment and we will review them later. So the first question is, what is solar energy? The second is, what flows up the chimney in the solar updraft tower? And the third is, what is the purpose of the solar updraft tower? So just keep those in the back of your head while we're performing our experiment. So our solar updraft tower, now we're going to move on to actually building our experiment. So I'm going to have you all gather some materials. For this experiment, you'll need three tin cans with the top and bottoms removed, um, masking tape, a thumbtack, a pencil, two boxes or books of the same size, that's important, paper, scissors, and a paper clip. Now, while you all are gathering those materials, I'm going to read to you a little bit of the science behind this experiment. So the solar updraft tower is a design concept for, re for renewable energy power plant for generating electricity from low temperature solar heat. Sunshine heats the air beneath a very wide greenhouse-like roofed collector structure surrounding the central base of a very tall chimney tower. Um, so if everyone has their materials, we are now going to move on to building our experiment. Let's move Alpha over here. So first we're going to start by making our pinwheel. So everyone, please take your sheet of paper. And what we're gonna do, can we switch to the overhead camera, please? Is fold it like so. We're gonna use this to cut a pinwheel. So fold it, try to get our creases and lines as even as possible. We go. And once we folded it like this, we're just going to cut the excess off. And it should now look like this. So I'm going to fold mine again just along the creases to make sure that my pinwheel sits correctly. So it should look something like this. Now we're going to take our scissors and cut along the creases. We wanna leave about an inch to a half an inch in the center, so don't cut all the way. And just for anyone who's just now joining us, all we've done so far is take our sheet of paper and fold it so that we can make our pinwheel. Okay, now once that is done, your paper should look like this, but the middle still intact. So now to make our pinwheel, we need to fold every other edge. So we're gonna start by taking this edge, folding it to the, skip, to the center, skipping this edge, taking this one, folding it to the center, skipping this edge, folding this one to the center, and skipping this edge, folding this one to the center. And your pinwheel should look like this once it's complete. And now we take our masking tape and just secure it. And you may have to put tape over every piece if it's easier for you that way, but it also works this way. And 
And now that we've made our pinwheel, we're just gonna sit this to the side to use a little bit later. It should look something like this. So now we're going to actually begin building our tower. So we're gonna take our three tin cans and stack them one on top of the other and secure them with tape. And once again, for anyone just now joining us so far, all we've done is make our pinwheel and now we are beginning to make our tower. So we have two cans taped so far, should look just like this. Once we've taped our cans together, our tower should look somewhat like this. And now we're going to create an arch at the center of our tower. So we're gonna take our paper clips you can use one or two. My paper clips are a little small, so I need to use two. And we're going to unbend them. And create an arch over the opening of our tower. So like I said, I have to use two paper clips because mine are a little small, which is fine. And if you do have to use two paper clips, I just suggest twisting them in the middle at a center point so that way they can stick together. Okay, okay. And once we're done, our arch should look something like this. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's okay if you have a little bit sticking up. And now we're gonna take our masking tape and secure both sides of our paper clip or our arch to the cans. So it should look like this. Um, so just to reiterate for our cans, for our tower, all we've done so far is take our three tin cans, tape them together with masking tape, and make sure that you can see directly through them. Make sure that these are empty cans with both the top and bottom removed. And after that, we've taken our paper clip, opened it to create somewhat of an arch. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be secure at the top of our can. And we're just going to use our masking tape again to secure it to the sides. Um, so I'm going to redo my pinwheel just for anyone who may have gotten lost or there was any confusion anywhere. So all we've done is we're going to take a plain sheet of paper, just like this one, and fold it like so. We want to try to get this corner as close as possible, just like this. And once we folded it, we're going to cut off the excess. so that our paper now looks like this. And there should be one crease down the middle and I'm going to create another crease so that it's easier for me to cut. So I'm just going to fold my paper in the opposite way. Just to make sure my creases are in there good. So now your paper should look like this and we're going to cut along the creases and you wanna leave about half an inch to an inch in the center. And you're gonna do this to all four corners. Now, now that we've cut our paper, it should look like this. Now for making the pinwheel, what you're gonna do is fold every other line. So 
I'm folding this one. Actually, I'm going to tape it and secure it so you all can see a little better. So we're going to take our first corner and fold it to the center. Tape to secure. Then we're going to skip this corner, move on to this one, fold it to the center, secure, skip this corner, move on to this one, fold and secure. And onto our last corner, skip this one, fold this one and secure. Once completed, your pinwheel should look something like this. This is it from the top, from the bottom. Okay, so I hope everyone has their pinwheel ready now. Um, we're actually almost finished building our tower. So going back to this, so far all we've done is take our three empty cans, stack them on top of one another, secure it with some masking tape. Um, we took our paper clip and opened it to create an arch. Like I stated earlier, you can use one or two paper clips depending on how big or small yours are. Um, moving on to the next step, we're now going to take our thumbtack. And please be careful with this step, guys. I have stuck myself more times than I'd like to admit. Um, and we're just going to secure it to the top of our arch. Hmm. The pointy side needs to be pointing up, so it should look like this. This is it from the side. Just like that. Um, once our tack is secured, we are almost finished our activity. Actually, we're going to go back to our pinwheel and place that on top of our tack. It needs to balance on top, so you shouldn't be puncturing the pinwheel, actually, you can take a pencil and create an indent. Can you go to the overhead camera, please? Like so, so that it sticks a little better in the center like that. And also, when we place our pinwheel on top of our tack, make sure that it's facing down. So the tape should be facing the inside. And we just need to balance it like so. Now, for this, this experiment, Oh yes, I'm sorry, one more step. For last thing we're gonna do is take our books and place them on the table and place our tower in the center of our books. This is why I said it's important that your books are the same, your books or boxes are the same height because your tower does need to balance in between it. As you guys can see, I left a little bit of space right here. This is for heat to flow through. Now, this experiment does require sunlight for an extended period of time. So for today, I have created an inside version to show you all what it's supposed to look like when you set yours out in the sun. So. For today, I'm using a heat lamp, but like I said, this, sun, this experiment uses sun, so you guys can sit your tower outside and eventually it will rotate. It just needs a second or two to heat up. Behind, okay. So the science behind this experiment is that the real one air will heat, the sun will heat up the books or the boxes or whatever you choose to place your tower on and it will heat it up enough so that air begins to flow upward. Like I showed you earlier, you leave a little bit of space in between the books so that the tower balances in between them and air will flow upward and cause the pinwheel to spin. As you can see, can we go to the overhead camera please? As you can see, this pinwheel is heating up and spinning. And it was spinning just like that. Oh, this one's working great.
And once again, this is what the other experiment looks like, just to show you all. And it will spin like this once it's heated up for an, a long enough. But like I said, it needs sunlight for an extended period of time. So please be patient with this experiment if it does not work right away. Now we're going to talk about the questions of the day. Those questions that I asked earlier that we asked you to keep in mind, we're going to now go over and answer them. So question number one, what is solar energy? Solar energy is energy harvested from the soil. Solar energy is energy from the sun that is converted into thermal or electrical energy or solar energy is energy from the ocean that is converted into water. I believe you guys know this. This was one of our vocabulary terms, so just keep that in mind. Give you guys a few more seconds to answer that. And you guys are correct. Energy from the sun that is converted into thermal or electrical energy. You guys are so smart. Um, our next question, what flows up the solar chimney tower? Is it A, water, B, hot air, or C, cold air? Give you guys a few seconds to answer that. A good hint to remember is where do we need to put our solar tower for it to work? <laughs> Give you guys a couple more seconds. Great, hot air, you guys are correct. And on to our last question. What is the purpose of the solar updraft tower? Is it A, to produce more biofuels? Is it B, to be a renewable energy power, po power plant? Or is it C, to add more carbon dioxide to the world, planet? I'll give you guys a few minutes to answer that. And the correct energy was B, to be a renewable energy power plant. You guys are so smart. Um, do you all have any questions? If not, we ask that you please email your pictures of today's experiment to webinar at stemnola.com. Um, we would love to see you guys recreate this experiment. We do have another live session coming up on um, Thursday, May 13th at 4 p.m. And the topic is forced emotion. So if that's something that interests you, please definitely join us. Give it up for Kennedy. Way to go, way to go, Kennedy. Kennedy, is she's been on staff now full time for a year. We're happy to have her here. And it's, all, it's always beautiful to see young people start out in college, go all the way through, get their STEM degree. And then we're honored to have them come and work back at STEM NOLA to give back to you. So we're glad that, that you all uh, chimed in today. And we look forward to seeing you all next week please email pictures, email pictures to webinar at stemnola.com. I believe there's a question for you, Kennedy. Can y'all read that question? They said, what do they need to do with the pen? Hey, 
Hey guys, what you need to do with your safety pin or thumbtack is attach it to your paper clip so that it kind of sticks out at the top of your arch. I just taped mine down. Um, you can wrap your paper clip around it if that works for you. Whatever you need to do to secure it down, just make sure that the pointy end is facing up because our pinwheel needs to balance on top of it. Like that. Does that clarify? Is there another question? Because I see two. I'm sorry? Yeah, they said thank you. Okay, no problem. Great. Okay. Oh, thank you. There you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kennedy. Remember, send, web send pictures to webinar at stemnola.com. One, we like to highlight you all, uh, but two, we like to show them to our sponsors. We bring this to you free of charge, and we, if that's pos as cap we are capable of doing that because we have sponsors that support us to make sure that people like Kennedy get paid to sit around and learn this stuff and create this stuff and have it to you. Uh, now we have some upcoming events. I'm sorry to say they, they're already booked up, but we have an event coming up on this Saturday, May 8th for STEM NOLA, which is our STEM Saturday, virtual STEM Saturday. It was hearts and circulation. I mean, the hearts and, hearts and circulatory system. Uh, then we have a, a program coming up sponsored by Shell and Baton Rouge. And it's buoyancy and density. And people say, well, buoyancy and density have to do with the petroleum and oil business. But there's, you know, they just had this major accident out in the Gulf of Mexico because the way they get to the oil rigs, they use a lot of ships and boats to move equipment and supplies and even do construction off of barges and things that float. So that is the time, Michelle. So look, I hope you all had a wonderful day today. I hope that you all tell your friends. In the summer, we may change the time. Uh, to be more amendable to everybody. When we first started out last year during the pandemic, we did it at like one central or two central. And then once schools kind of started going back, we moved it to four central. So we're gonna play it by ear and see what works for everyone so we can maximize the participation over the summer. But you all keep doing what you're doing. Uh, keep innovating, creating and making. And Stem Nola gonna be here to serve you. Thank you all. I'm Dr. Kelvin Mackey. Have a great day.